Have you ever wanted to justify your treatment options with solid, nice guidance but failed to remember the details? Then you're just in the right place. Welcome to the Nice GP YouTube channel, a channel where you will find summarised current nice guidance relevant to primary care. I am Fernando Florido, I'm a GP in the United Kingdom with an interest in diabetes. In this video, I will go through the NICE guideline type 2 diabetes in adults management. I am sure that once you have seen the presentation, you will find it easier to manage diabetic patients according to the guideline. So let's go straight in. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals who are interested in type 2 diabetes. Without further preamble, let's start this episode. In this episode, we will be discussing the type 2 diabetes NICE guidelines, that is, guideline NG28. This guideline was first published in 2015 and it was last updated on the 16th of December 2020. This guideline is very comprehensive and covers not only the management of blood glucose levels, but also every aspect of diabetes care. In addition, the guideline contains multiple links to other NICE guidelines covering other relevant clinical areas of diabetes care, such as, for example, the management of hypertension, lipids, neuropathic pain and chronic disease. It also contains links to other guidance in respect of specific drug treatments, for example, SGLT2 inhibitors, safety information, for example, MHRA safety advice, and other relevant guidance such as information about medical standards of fitness to drive. In order to help with the flow of information, any reference to another guidance within this one will be summarised as part of the overall holistic management of the patient. By the way of introduction, we will start by saying that type 2 diabetes is a chronic metabolic condition characterised by insulin resistance, that is the body's inability to effectively use insulin, and insufficient pancreatic insulin production resulting in high blood glucose levels or hyperglycemia. Type 2 diabetes is commonly associated with obesity, physical inactivity, raised blood pressure, disturbed lipid levels and a tendency to develop thrombosis and therefore it is recognised to have an increased cardiovascular risk. It is also associated with long-term microvascular and macrovascular complications together with reduced quality of life and life expectancy. It is estimated that about 90% of adults currently diagnosed with diabetes in the UK have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is more common in people of African, African Caribbean and South Asian family origin. It can occur in all age groups and is increasingly being diagnosed in children. Multiple vascular risk factors and complications make diabetes care complex and time consuming and many services must be involved for optimal management. Necessary lifestyle changes and the complexities of possible side effects of therapy make patient education and self-management important aspects of diabetes care. This guideline contains recommendations for managing type 2 diabetes in adults and focuses on patient education, dietary advice, managing cardiovascular risk, managing glucose levels and identifying and managing long-term complications. This guideline does not cover diagnosis, secondary diabetes, type 1 diabetes in adults, diabetes in pregnancy and diabetes in children and young people. Patient education is extremely important and we must offer structured education to patients and or their family members and carers and at at around the time of diagnosis with annual reinforcement and review. We must also ensure that any structured education programme has a structured curriculum and that is delivered by trained educators. Group education programmes is the preferred option for this. In terms of dietary advice and bariatric surgery, we must provide individualised and ongoing nutritional and dietary advice, emphasising advice on healthy balanced eating that is applicable to the general population. We must encourage high fibre, low glycemic index sources of carbohydrates such as fruit, vegetables, whole grains and pulses. We must also include low-fat dairy products and oily fish and control the intake of foods containing saturated and trans fatty acids. At the same time, this dietary advice should be integrated with other aspects of lifestyle modification 
such as increasing physical activity and losing weight. For adults with type 2 diabetes who are overweight, we should set an initial weight loss target of 5 to 10 percent, remembering that lesser degrees of weight loss may still be of benefit. When individualizing recommendations for carbohydrate and meal patterns, reducing the risk of hypoglycemia should be a particular aim for a person using insulin and sulfonylurea. And finally, the use of foods marketed specifically for people with diabetes should be discouraged. There are recommendations on bariatric surgery in a separate guideline, which basically states that patients whose diagnosis of type 2 diabetes has been made within the last 10 years, we should offer an assessment for bariatric surgery to those with a BMI of 35 or more. We should consider it for those with a BMI between 30 and 35. We should also consider it for those of Asian family origin with a lower BMI, depending on our clinical judgment. In respect of diagnosing and managing hypertension, we must bear in mind that the diagnosis, treatment and monitoring of hypertension is broadly the same for people with type 2 diabetes as for other people. There is a separate NICE guideline for hypertension and when a different approach is needed for people with type 2 diabetes, this is specified in that hypertension guideline. As a simple summary of this long guideline, what it basically says is that we need to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension in people with a clinic blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher and an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring average or home blood pressure monitoring average of 135 over 85 or higher. That is a threshold of 140 over 90 in clinic and 135 over 85 at home or in an ambulatory setting. Once the diagnosis has been made, we must reduce the clinic blood pressure to below 140 over 90 if the patient is under 80 or below 150 over 90 in patients aged 80 and over, obviously using our clinical judgment. That is a threshold of 140 over 90 for under 80s and 150 over 90 for over 80s. Or if we're using an ambulatory blood pressure monitor or home blood pressure monitoring, we must reduce the blood pressure to below 135 over 85 for patients aged under 80 or 145 over 85 for patients aged 80 and over. That is a threshold of 135 over 85 under 80s and 145 over 85 for over 80s. In terms of the treatment, the main message is that we need to offer an ACE inhibitor or an ARB to patients with type 2 diabetes of any age or family origin at step one of the antihypertensive treatment. Further antihypertensive management is as per the rest of the population. Now in terms of recommendations on antiplatelet therapy and cardiovascular risk reduction, we must not offer antiplatelet therapy, aspirin or clopidogrel to patients with type 2 diabetes without cardiovascular disease. So we mustn't use it as primary prevention. For guidance on the primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes, there's a separate NICE guideline on cardiovascular disease, which is primarily aimed at lipid management. As a summary of this guideline, we will say that this guideline includes recommendations on risk assessment for cardiovascular disease and on the use of lipid-lowering drugs. In terms of assessing cardiovascular disease risk, we must prioritise people with an estimated 10-year risk of 10% more. We would normally use the GIL risk assessment tool to assess the cardiovascular risk for primary prevention up to and including 84 years of age. People with an EGFR less than 60 and or albuminuria are at an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and therefore Q risk is not appropriate. Lifestyle modifications for the primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease include all the usual advice on cardioprotective diet, physical activity, weight management, alcohol consumption, smoking cessation, but we must also be aware that plant stanols and sterols are not recommended for people with type 2 diabetes. When it comes to lipid modification therapy, we must remember that when a decision is made to prescribe a statin, we will normally use a statin of high intensity and low acquisition cost.
Before starting lipid modification therapy with a statin, we must take a full lipid profile, which should include measurement of total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol and triglycerides. A fasting sample is not needed for this. In addition, we also need to take an HbA1c, renal function and EGFR, transaminase levels and thyroid stimulating hormone. We must consider the possibility of familial hypercholesterolemia if the patient has a high total cholesterol, more than 7.5, and we must also be aware that the cardiovascular risk may be underestimated by the risk assessment tools if the triglyceride levels are raised. If lifestyle modification is ineffective or inappropriate, we will offer a statin, generally a tofastatin 20 mg, for the primary prevention of cardiovascular risk to people who have a 10% or greater 10-year risk of developing cardiovascular disease using the Q-Risk Assessment Tool. For people 85 years or older, we should still consider a tofastatin 20 mg because statins may be a benefit reducing the risk of non-fatal myocardial infarction. For secondary prevention, we will generally start at all statin 80 mg and we can use a lower dose if there are potential drug interactions or a high risk of adverse events. But we must not delay statin treatment in secondary prevention. If a person has acute coronary syndrome, we will take a lipid sample on admission, start the statin and repeat the sample about three months after the start of treatment. For people with chronic kidney disease, we will offer tofastatin 20 mg for the primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease and increase the dose if we don't achieve a 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol and the EGFR is 30% or more. If the EGFR is less than 30, we need to discuss the use of higher doses with a renal specialist. In terms of follow-up of people started on starting treatment, we need to measure the lipid profile again at three months and aim for a greater than 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol. If this target is not achieved, we need to consider increasing the dose if started on less than a total of statin 80 mg and the person is judged to be at higher risk. We will provide annual medication reviews for people taking statins, including an annual non-fasting blood test for non-HDL cholesterol to inform the discussion. Discussion. In respect of advice and monitoring for adverse effects, we need to advise patients on a statin that other drugs, some foods, for example grapefruit juice, and some supplements may interfere with statins. If a patient has had persistent, generalized, and explained muscle pain, we will need to measure creatine kinase levels. If creatine kinase levels are more than five times the upper limit of normal, we will recheck it after seven days. And if it's still five times the upper limit of normal, we will not start a statin. If creatine kinase levels are raised but less than five times the upper limit of normal, we will need to start the statin at a lower dose. We will also advise people who are taking a statin to seek medical advice if they develop muscle symptoms like pain, tenderness or weakness and if this occurs we will measure creatine kinase. However, we must not measure creatine kinase levels in asymptomatic patients on a statin. We must also measure baseline liver transaminase levels before starting statin and again within three months of starting treatment and at 12 months, but not again unless clinically indicated. We must also remember that we will not routinely exclude from starting therapy patients who have raised transaminase levels which are less than three times the upper limit of normal. Also, we must remember that statins are contraindicated in pregnancy and women of childbearing age need to be advised of the potential teratogenic risk of statins and to stop taking them if pregnancy is a possibility. Also, Women planning pregnancy need to stop taking statins three months before they attempt to conceive and must not restart them until breastfeeding is finished. If a person is not able to tolerate a high intensity statin, we can try to treat with a lower dose that is tolerated, telling the person that any statin at any dose reduces the cardiovascular risk. If someone reports adverse effects on a statin, we can discuss the following possible strategies. One, stopping and trying again when the symptoms are gone. Two, reducing the dose with the same intensity group. Two, reducing the dose within the same intensity group of statin. Or three, changing the statin to a lower intensity group of statins. We must also seek specialist advice for patients who are intolerant to three different statins. In general, for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, 
we will not offer fibrates, nicotinic acid, bile acid sequestrants, or anion exchange resins, or omega-3 fatty acid compounds, either alone or in combination therapy with a statin. However, patients with primary hypercholesterolemia should be considered for a cetimide treatment in line with NICE guidelines. This is the end of this episode of the Diabetes in Primary Care podcast. You can find it on your favourite podcast provider and you will also be able to find links to the guidelines mentioned in the description. Thank you for listening.